Well, hello, everybody. How we doing? Oh, how we doing, folks? We're good. We're good. All right. Hey, it is so good to be with you. I'm glad you're here. My name is Luke, one of the pastors around here, and I'm just grateful that we get to get to spend a few time, few moments together, some time together to open God's word and let him continue to shape us and mold us and who he's called us and created us uh, to be. I want to take a moment uh, to start our service. Uh, did you, can I just tell you something awesome? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. We love good news. God is on the move. God is on the move. He is working here in our community. He's working in our country. He is working across the world. And you may hear things differently. Oh, the world is, you know, falling apart and all these different things. Yeah, there's trouble in the world. You better believe it. Why? Because sin. And this isn't how it should be. But I know this to be true. God is on the move and he is at work. And so we're going to take just a moment to actually pray for some brothers and sisters uh, in our community. Uh, I think about some amazing churches and there are a lot of amazing pastors in our community. And God is on the move. I think about Pastor Josh Tovey at Redemption. I think about Pastor Keone at Grace Community. I think about Pastor Steve at Wellspring and a number of other amazing churches in our community. God is moving in those places. And we just want to take a moment to pray. Maybe you have a friend uh, that's a part of another church community or you know some other ministries or pastors or whatever. We just want to take a minute to pray for them in our community. We want to take a minute to pray because God is not moving here just in West Michigan, but across Michigan and across our, uh, across our country. I think about Pastor Tito Diaz and the, the church Riza in the Ann Arbor area and, and Tree Line in Ann Arbor and Commons Church in Lansing. Uh, and did you know we actually have a couple locations around here called Chapel Point Byron Center and Chapel Point Holt. God is moving in these places and we want to be praying uh, for them that God would continue to use them. And I think about this. We're a church that we want to be engaged in kingdom expansion, and we are seeing God move across the world. And and I'm grateful for right now we have a team that's in the Philippines with Pastor Nathan, uh, was our worship pastor. And then he and his sweet wife, Lauren, and their kids, Addie and Liam, uh, chose, as we would say in the South, they sold the farm and moved across the the ocean uh, to the the Philippines. And so God is on the move there where they have a group, a network of 13 churches. And guess what? That group of 13 churches got together just 12 plus hours ago, worshiped Jesus together, and 40 people were baptized. And so, Yeah, come on. Just to see and hear small stories. God moves in the small things and in the big things. And you see some of these folks that were baptized. I mean, like, how awesome is that in a river in the Philippines? God is moving God is moving and he wants to continue to to work in and through us and through his church. And so I want to invite us to take a few moments as a church before we dive into the word of God and we ask God to to do some work in us. And and that's what I love when we approach the scriptures together. It's to let God do what only he can do in us. But we want to take a moment uh, to be mindful and praying for churches in our community, across our country and across the world. So will you join me in in a few moments of prayer? And I'm inviting you uh, to to actively pray and participate uh, with me as we pray. Pray and call out to God on behalf of some other churches that you may know because God is on the move. And so God, we thank you for God, we just thank you for you, that you are a God who does not stop. You're not a God who uh, sits back and, and is on autopilot, but God, you are a God who is active and moving and you are leading and guiding and you're continuing to draw lost, broken, sinful people back to you through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so God, I'm, I'm simply just giving you praise and thanks, God, for Redemption Church and for Grace and for Wellspring, God, and for all the churches in West Michigan. God, I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you would do a work in them. God, continue to change and transform lives as the name of Jesus is lifted high. God, I pray for Pastor Tim and Pastor Michael in New England and in New York. God, that you would just show up with our brothers and sisters there uh, as, as we just walk hand in hand and life in life with those churches. God, for, for Tito. And, and Molly, God, at Riza, God, would you just bless them, God? Would you let them uh, see, God, all the hard work is worth it, God, because you are on the move. And God, for what happened in the Philippines, God, we simply just say praise you and thank you that you are God uh, who is still in the work of saving and redeeming people. So God, this testimony of 40 new brothers and sisters saying, I am a follower of Jesus and I will live differently. I will follow Jesus. I realize that I was in need of a savior and they are making that bold proclamation to, uh, that made this bold proclamation today. God, we give you thanks. So God, would you do what only you can do? Work in these next few moments as we open your word and we ask you, Jesus, to be lifted high 
Lift it high, God, because it is for your glory that we gather and it's for your glory that we live. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Amen. I don't know if you've been around church for a while, if you're new to church. Why do people say amen at the end of prayers? And this may be like old hat for some of you, but for some of you it may not be. The word amen simply means so be it. And what we just engaged in was, it was a, a spiritual thing together that we're not just listening to somebody talk, but we are calling out to God and, and spirit is crying out to God. Deep cries out to deep is one way to think about it that we've seen in the scriptures that we just engage in something. And so there's this collective unified moment. And when we say amen, it's us agreeing in faith together. So be these things, God, would these things come to pass? And so just if you are ever wondered why, there you go. That's what amen means. But I'm also, I want to encourage you. Uh, this may be, I know, can I just be nice for a minute to you, for you guys? And I want you to hear it nicely. Can we agreed? We're, we're, I'm being nice. You guys are nice northerners. You're really nice. You're respectable. You're presentable. You like, you guys are really nice. But sometimes me as a southerner, I need to know you're with me. And, and sometimes if God's moving and you hear something, it's okay for you to be vocal in church, give a little amen. So can we try this together uh, on the count of three? One, two, three. Amen. One, two, three. Amen. Oh, oh, see now folks, now we're ready for some church. I love it. I love it. So, so we can talk. We can have some fun. You can give an amen, a hallelujah if you're feeling a little crazy, all right? I want you to stand with me for the reading of God's word. Genesis 39. Genesis chapter 39. We're going to pick up five pause. That's where you're going to, uh, that's where you're going to jump in and throw in that word. So we're picking up where we left off last week, and we're going to continue to walk forward in the story of Joseph. Genesis 39, starting in verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph. And he showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. And the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. This is the word of the Lord. You can grab a seat. Question for you. Where is Joseph? Are you sure? Are you sure that you're sure? Uh, He was in prison. I I want you to understand, anytime we open God's word and we read his scriptures, anytime you see things repeated over and over again, whether it's once, twice, or a lot of times, God wants us to pay attention. So that would be a really clunky sentence for many of us to write. Like repetition much, your Grammarly account would say, remove these words, say it differently. Uh, and, And so we need to lean in for a moment and say, what's going on here? Why is this highlighted so much? Because Joseph is in prison and he's in a place that he shouldn't be. He is in a place of despair, discouragement, somewhere that he shouldn't be or we would think he shouldn't be because it's not what we would want if we were in, uh, in his shoes, right? None of us want to go to prison. It's not a place that you want to hang out. Even if you're playing Monopoly, you're trying to quickly get past that square, are you not? You don't want to be in prison, but it's highlighting this for us because what else did you see in that passage? There's two times that it said that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. So we're getting this, this contrast between he's where? In he's in prison. He's not where he wants to be. And the Lord is repeated over and over again. Four times throughout the chapter 39, the Lord was with him. And so we want to be reminded. I want us to kind of piggyback last week's message and this week that the Lord is is with you. The Lord is with you. We have to be reminded that this great truth of the scriptures is so foundational for us as followers of Jesus, that the Lord is with you. It distinguishes God and it changes everything about us because it is an incredible reminder that no matter the circumstances, the highs, things are good, you're out of prison, or if you're in prison, the Lord is, the Lord is with you. This is a huge reminder for us because I, I want us to, to, to think about it in this way. Um, we have grown up, most of us, I'm going I'm to put myself in the middle age bracket. We've grown up in a day and age where instant gratification and we solve problems instantly. Uh, I grew up in the day and age of Saved by the Bell and Fresh Prince of Bel Air, right? These, that, that there's a problem that happens in the episode and within 28 minutes it's solved, right? 
And if it's a little big issue, you know, like when, when, when the Saved by the Bell kids had a drug issue, it was a two-episode problem that they had to solve, right? You know, to be continued, dun, dun, dun. And then it's solved in a matter of weeks. This is a driver for us, even if we don't think about it. It's this undercurrent. We expect problems to be solved like that. But no matter the timeline, no matter the situation, our foundation, as seen in the scriptures, is that the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. So I want, to, I want to wrap this for us. Joseph's story, we could read this in a matter of chapters. 37 to 50 is the whole totality of his story. And, and that's barely even like a podcast episode if we were just going to listen to it from front, read it from front end to the back end. It would be done like that. But I want us to be reminded, look at this with me, that Joseph was 17. You'll see it on the screen. You can take some notes with it. Joseph, he was 17 when his brothers threw him into a pit because of the dream, the word that God had given him that one day the sheaves are going to bow down and the stars are going to bow down. This telling that Joseph's family is going to bow to him as a leader. He was 17 and because of that he was thrown into the pit. And from that moment, at the age of 17, he was enslaved for another 11 years in Potiphar's house. 11 years. Do I have like any like 10, 11, 12 year olds in the room? You raise your hand. That's a long life, right, sister? Like, I mean, you're, you're, it's, it's a lot of time right there. 11 years. 11 years he is enslaved, even though in the midst of it, God is showing up and he's causing all that he does to succeed. If you remember from last week, because God is with him in the midst of it, but it's still slavery. It's still injustice. It's still the life that he probably didn't imagine for himself. And we find up and we pick up today that he is thrown into prison and it's going to be two more years of hardship. Two more years Now, I'm not real great at math, but 11 plus 2 is what? 13 from the back, a strong, hearty 13. I like it. 13 years of hate from his brothers and Potiphar's wife and Potiphar and everything else that may have happened that's not recorded in the scriptures. Lies. His brothers lied to his dad, told him that he was dead. Could you imagine uh, someone in your family giving up hope on you? And his dad did. Lies. Lies from Potiphar's wife that caused him to be thrown into prison. Abuse from Potiphar and Potiphar's wife being enslaved and, and, and slandered and then thrown into prison and neglect. Put in the prison and forgotten. 13 years of disappointment. 13 years of discouragement. And I want us to think about that in light of this incredible truth that the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us. And I don't know where you are on your journey. I don't know what's going on in all of your stories. Sometimes it's going to mean the long game. It's going to mean you're going to have to stay faithful, leaning into who God is even though your heart and your mind and your body may be crying out for an answer, we are going to play the long game. Because God is at work, and I can tell you this because I know what happens in a couple, a couple chapters and we'll get there. God does fulfill his promises, even if it takes decades. Because why? The God that we serve is with us, and he is faithful. And so I want us to continue in this passage. Read with me in Genesis chapter 40. With that as an understanding, kind of wrapping around that this is not a momentary affliction. This is not a momentary problem, but it is one that is going to take years to make him. We're going to get a kind of a new snapshot of what's happening with Joseph in prison. So Genesis 40, starting in verse 1, read along with me. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them into custody of the house of the captain of the guard in prison where Joseph was confined. And the captain of guard appointed Joseph to be with them and he attended them. Again, notice, even in prison, he's being forced to be some type of slave to attend to them. And they continue for some time in custody. Two just quick random things I just want to throw at you. And then we're going to continue. There's some bigger ideas I want us to lean into in this moment. Can we just say praise and thanks to our bosses that when we make mistakes, they don't throw you in prison? 
Like, this is a bad day at work. It's a bad day at the office. If you make your boss mad and you get thrown into prison, it's all about some perspective. I know that's a little lighthearted, but it really just caught me off guard this moment. Praise God that if every mistake I've ever made, Pastor Joel did not throw me into prison because I've made a few of them and I'm probably going to make some more this next week. So praise God. It's about perspective in our lives that no matter the situation or the circumstances that we find ourselves in, it all has to do with perspective. It all is about perspective because your problem may not be like someone else's, but it still may be a difficulty, but it is about perspective. And and we just note in this moment, verse 3, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. And that's a word that we may not use in today's day and age, but it means that God's plan and his purpose is going to be accomplished. Because of all the places that these two men could have been put in prison, where are they? They are put in prison, and the writer perfectly notes where Joseph was confined. God's sovereignty in every situation, in every circumstance. We want to look for these incredible truths as we open scripture. That God is speaking to us in so many different ways through the power of his word and by the power of the Holy Spirit to be reminded of. It's about perspective. We see God's sovereignty. Do you see God's sovereignty in every moment of your day? That God is at work in the small details. But when I think about Joseph and kind of the big picture, the, the big things for us, is that we see Joseph in one, point, one part of his life is thrown into prison by his family. And now where do we find him? In another pit, another dark place where he is thrown against his will. But he is going to show up and be faithful. This is the call for us. And I want to think about it for a moment. If, we're, if God is sovereign and God is the one who is leading us and he's guiding us for his plans, his purpose, for his glory, if there's anything I can encourage you to begin to wrap your life around and to live by, that it's God's plans, God's purpose, his glory. God's purpose, his plans, his glory. That's what it's all about. But when we think about that, I want us to understand that our God does not leave us alone. I'm reminded of this. Write this passage down, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. That passage, you need to read all of Romans 8 and just see how God is at work. But I want to highlight that verse for us for a few moments. Because God is at work in what things? all things, not just some things, not just big things, not just hard things, not just easy things, not just little things. God is at work in all things, working them together, meaning he is knitting it together. He's writing a story that is for good. It is for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So it's God's plan, God's purpose, his glory, and our good. God's purpose, God's plan, His glory, and our good. And can I tell you this? Oh my goodness. Hey, I just got some good news for you. Did you know that every single one of us was made with purpose and intentionality? Because what I know about every person, whether they are a follower of Jesus or whether they are not a follower of Jesus, every human being, every life, every heartbeat and breath in our lungs was made with purpose for one thing, to give God glory. In fact, the understanding, the theological term from Genesis is that we are made in the image of God. The Imago Dei is how some writers may talk about it. The image of God meant to reflect parts of who he is. As I look around this room, everyone looks different and is beautiful because you right now are reflecting back to me the glory of God. You are reflecting back to me. I'm looking with my eyes and I see the glory of God because he is a God who is creative and creates unique people and shows his glory off through us, our personalities. Every part of us is created with purpose. So I know, I know when I read the scriptures that you're created with purpose and he wants to work all things together for the good of those he's called. And he's calling to each and every one of us. Sometimes we just a little hard to hear his call. And sometimes we forget the purpose that we are made for. And so what we see that purpose that God created Joseph for, we see it pick up with me in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 40. 
And one night, uh, the cupbearer and the baker, they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. And when Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. I want you to highlight, underline that verse. We're going to come back to it, because it's an interesting thing that the writer notes for us. And so he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? And they said to them, we've had dreams, and there's no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God please tell them to me I love this part of the passage because again God is working his purpose and his plan for his glory out in the life of Joseph Joseph simply gets to respond that's all we get to do it seems like in every situation it's it's how do we respond How do we react in the situations that God has placed us in? And I want us to see three things real quick. They're not going to be on the screen, but I want you to write these things down. I want you to see that Joseph saw their need. Joseph saw their need. The question for us is, do we have eyes to see the needs of the people around us? Joseph saw the needs of the people in the midst of prison, in the midst of his own hardships. Joseph has eyes that are up and out instead of looking down and in at himself. And woe is him. He's in prison. Everyone for how many years? 13 years. Now we're kind of in the middle. So between that 11 and, 11 and 13, uh, if we're just being accurate. In the midst of that, he could be woe is me. My life is tough. It's so hard. But he has eyes that are up and out. Did you see it there at the end of verse 6? He saw that they were what? He saw that they were troubled. He saw their trouble. Do you have eyes to see? It's one of the things that I'm grateful for us as a church. It is, it is a huge value for us that we want to keep the eyes of Chapel Point off Chapel Point. We want to be, have kingdom eyes that are up and out to look around the world and to see the needs around us whether they are small needs and they're your neighbor or whether they're global needs and we can step into it uh, in any way that we can. We want to be a church that sees with eyes that are up and out. Do you have eyes to see the needs of the people around you? No matter your circumstances. I love to that in the midst of it, Joseph does something really special. Instead of going, oh, shucks, man, that's tough. Sorry about it. You had a bad day. He does something unique. He points them to the solution. Because the Egyptian people, these guys were high up in Pharaoh's court. They would have had a whole other religious system and a way of interpreting the world and a way of understanding the world. And they were now, because they're in prison, cut off to that religious system, to the Egyptian, uh, you know, royal things that would be happening with Pharaoh and the different magicians and, you know, people that would understand things and they're wise people to understand what these dreams are. They are cut off because they're in prison. And so they are left without a solution But Joseph, in the midst of his hardship, shows up and he points them to the solution. God alone. Joseph said to them, look at it in verse 8. Do not interpretations belong to God? Because they they were worried. No one's here to interpret these dreams for us. We can't do this on our own. But Joseph points to them in the midst of their despair and discouragement. He says the solution is God alone. The solution is God alone. And so that's a question for us that we need to wrestle with. As you live your life and as you find uh, problems, whatever they may be, whether they're relationship oriented, whether they happen to be in your business, your work, students, school work, whatever it looks like, where are you looking for the solutions? Are you looking around to yourself, to the world, to the culture around you? Or are you looking to God alone as the answer for those problems? Because Joseph is telling us that the answer, the solution, is found in God alone. And this, I love this part. Joseph tells them, well, one, he comes to them and says, hey, I see you're troubled. So he steps into action. He says, why are you downcast? I see that you're troubled. So we see a moment of serving. But then he goes on to say at the end of verse 8, please tell them to me. In the midst of Joseph's suffering, he chooses to serve. He chooses to serve. In the midst of your suffering, in the midst of your hardships, the midst of your highs and lows, what choices are you making? Are you choosing to serve other people around you or are you choosing to look at yourself? Are you choosing to think about your own problems and your own scenarios and your own things that are going on in your world? Because Joseph, even in the midst of being where? 
in prison chooses to see other people's problems and to step in pointing them to God alone and then saying, God, I'm here to be your conduit to serve these men however you want to do it. He chooses to serve in the midst of his suffering. It reminds me, there's a quote from Warren Wearsby that uh, Pastor Jim has reminded me, and it just always kind of rings in the back of my head. It says, ministry takes place where divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Ministry, meaning where God shows up and he does his work, takes place when divine resources, God showing up to bring an interpretation to meet the human needs of the cupbearer and the baker through the loving channel of Joseph to the glory of God. So the question for us is, is God wanting to use us as conduits for his grace and his mercy to be echoed in the lives of the people around us? Are we willing to see the problems? Are we willing to point to the solution? Are we willing to serve in the midst of our suffering? Because when we do that, that's where God's going to show up and real ministry is going to take place. Where divine resources and human need find this convergence of God showing up to work in and through his people. God chooses to work through his creation. Could he just show up and help everyone out? Yes, can he? But he chooses to for his glory, his plan, and his purpose to work through us. To work through you wherever you are. This is what our God does. And so I just want to remind us. Again, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I see plenty of prayer requests that come through this church, which I want to say a huge thank you and encourage you. If you have your notes and there's something small or there's something big that we as a church and elders of this church, we can pray for you. I promise you this. You've got some warriors praying for you that are in your corner lifting you and your needs up. And so it's important that you tear off that little section on your worship guide and you drop it in an offering box or hand it to one of the people at guest services because I promise you tomorrow I'm going to get an email with the prayer request. And I promise you this, I am praying for you. And I promise you that our team is praying for you. You get to, in every situation, be used by God. And so again, I don't know what you're sitting with. I don't know where you are. I'm inviting you to seek opportunities for let us be the church around you but i want to challenge you with something you can sit in that discouragement you can sit in that problem or you can do something about it you can do something about it and we see in the life of joseph he's going to do something about it instead of sitting in his prison and moaning and groaning he chooses to serve He chooses to rest in who his God is, and he chooses to see the needs of people around you. Church, how how are we doing with that? How are we doing with that? And I just wanted to just a call for us to let God work in us and through us. Because if you remember last week, we, we asked this question, is your life undeniable evidence that God is with you? I want to provide an answer to that question. A steady and serving life is proof that you're walking with God. A steady and serving life is proof and evidence you're walking with God. It reminds me of what James writes in his letter in the New Testament in chapter 1. He says, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. If we say we believe in a God who is with us and for us, but yet our lives look and act differently, then we don't actually have that faith. And that too often is what our culture sees is a bunch of people that say, we believe this, but I'm doing everything in my own power and I'm worried about me and and, and I'm sitting in my misery. But we have a God who is with us. And so in the midst of your suffering and in the midst of your struggles, the question for us is, how are you living out your faith? Because a steady and serving life is proof that you are walking with God. It shows that your faith is legitimate. It's proof. It's evidence. So what steps are you taking? And it reminds me, I want you to write this uh, verse down, Matthew 20, verse 28. Jesus is talking with some of his disciples, and and, and they're actually having a conversation about who's the greatest among us. And they get lost in this conversation because they're trying to make it about themselves. But Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 20, verse 28, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
Jesus is not only the way, the truth, and the life, that we have a relationship with God the Father. He's the model of what our life is to look like. We are being conformed, shaped into who Jesus has called and created us to be, and it looks a whole lot like Jesus. Why? Because we reflect the glory of God, the image of God. We are meant to do that. And so he's saying, he's modeling it for us. I came not to be served, but to what? To serve To give his life as a ransom for many. Did you know that our life has been called to be given away? Your life has been called and made for his purpose, his glory, and for your good to be given away. Your life is meant to be given away. And we just can't overstate that, that this is God himself. Jesus the Christ, the second person in the Trinity, God, fully God, and somehow in this mystery, fully man, shows up in time and space, and he tells us this is what it's all about, to lay down your life, and he models it for us. So I want to read, I want to kind of move uh, through this passage as we get to these dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. So the chief cupbearer in verse 9 told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there's a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. And as soon as it budded, it blossoms, shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are going to be three days. And in three days, Pharaoh will lift your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as you formerly were, as formerly when you were his cupbearer. I want you to notice with me verses 14 and 15. Only remember me, Joseph tells him, when it is well with you. And please do this kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so to get me out of his house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I've done nothing that they should put me into the pit. It's a good news that the cupbearer gets. The interpretation is, hey, it's three days. It's a little bit of a problem. You're not where you want to be, but one day you're going to be restored. But I want you to notice, Joseph, it seems like there's a little bit of a chink in his armor. And everything else that we've seen in the scripture that has happened with Joseph, he's silent. We don't know what's going on, that inner monologue that he's having. We don't understand his feelings because the writer doesn't make it known to us. But I think it's a significant thing for us to see that Joseph now is speaking out in the midst of prison. After how many years? Thirteen. I mean, like, a long time. Like, it is not good. He's been silent. He's enduring. He has patience. He has long-suffering. But we see a moment, and he's not saying anything that seems like out out of character. He's not saying, you know, God's not with him. It's just a moment of, here's the reality of my situation. But I think it's one thing for us to note because he's saying, hey, will you please, uh, he's throwing out a lifeline to someone that he knows is not walking with God. And he's throwing out a lifeline to someone that, that that is just showing up before him. And it's a reminder for us. A reminder for every single one of us. Where are we finding our help? Where are we actually looking and putting our trust into that? And I wonder if in that moment, this is just Luke Bilberry, I'm wondering if in that moment he had a glimpse of going, oh, this is it. This is my only chance to get out of here. And, he, and I'm assuming and I'm trusting that he has faith because God has continued to work his plan, his purpose, for his glory, for Joseph's good out in this situation. But I wonder if he got excited. Please remember me. Show me this kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh. Mention me to Pharaoh. And he gives a little backstory. I was a Hebrew. This unjust thing happened and I was thrown into the pit and I was sold into slavery. And now here I am and unjustly in this moment again. It reminds me of what Jesus did. As a contrast, Jesus before his accusers stood silent. And it was even prophesied in Isaiah that like a lamb silent, he would be led to the slaughter in order to make peace between us and God. That going to the cross, Jesus has this silence. He's not bucking against it. And he's not saying, you guys are acting unjustly. But he's enduring the suffering as he goes to the cross. And so I want to ask you this question. Is your hope in the hands of man? Or is it in the hands of an almighty God? Again, it's, it's okay. It is good to talk about things that are going on in our lives. But ultimately, I want to remind us of that foundation. Who is with you? 
God is with you. Where is your help? It reminds me in Psalm 121, write that verse down. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The God who made everything, the psalmist reminds us, is where our help comes from. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. And, and I think that is a, just a reminder, God's scripture highlighting a moment where Joseph finally speaks to help us think, where is our help coming from? Because what we're going to find in this next part of the verse, look with me, verse 20. On the third day, again, the baker gets bad news, and we're just going to skip past bad news because we don't like bad news. Does anybody like bad news? No. So ba- the baker's not going to, one's good, one's bad. We're about to find out. All right, to verse 20. Here we go. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, meaning he brought them out of prison among his servants. And he restored the chief cupbearer, yay, to his position. And he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is good news. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted in the dreams. So one gets a good interpretation of the dream. You know, one gets this negative. But I want you to notice something. Yet the chief cupbearer who is blessed by God through the suffering service of Joseph, did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Forgot him. Can I just just wrap our minds around something for a moment? In this life, you will face discouragement. In this life, you will face hardships. In this life, you will face dark days. And here's why I know this, is because in the beginning, God created everything in Genesis 1, and he said it is good. He said it's good. His creation is good. And yet, why do so many of us right now look around the world and hear stories of fear and have worry and anxiety and brokenness and we experience hardships in our marriages and our friendships and we experience death and we experience loss We are fired from our jobs or things don't go the way that we planned. Why do these things happen? Because Genesis 3 tells us that sin shows up and it ruins everything. Sin shows up and breaks our relationship with God the Father. It ruins our walk with Him that was meant to be intimate and special and significant. And yet sin rips us apart from the life we were meant to live with the God who is with us. We are no longer able to be with God because the sin that is in us. It ruins everything. That's where it begins to break apart. And then it ripples into our relationships. Adam and Eve, they begin to point fingers and blame. Their marriage begins to be one that instead of peace is one that is contentious. She did it, and he's silent, and he didn't show up as the man leading his home as he should. It ripples into their first children, Cain and Abel, where brother kills brother. Sin breaks our relationship with one another. We see the brokenness and sin in our world. In fact, Romans tells us that all creation is yearning for things to be made whole again because we experience war and famine and hurricanes and tornadoes and all sorts of stuff that probably wasn't like it was supposed to be. That's my understanding as I look at the scriptures. And sin also breaks us internally with ourselves. Confuse, worry, fear, anxiety, depression, all sorts of stuff that we may not fully understand, but we feel something inside of us isn't right. Sin ruins everything. You will face discouragement and despair. The question is, is how are we going to passionately respond? As transform followers of Jesus, that is the call. How will we passionately respond? You're going to face hardships. You're going to face trials. You're going to face struggles. How are you going to respond, my friends? And so I, I think about May 13th. We're all one phone call away from everything changing. The day that my dad unexpectedly passed away. And I'm careful to tell this story because it's like a passion point for me. And I don't want any, uh, it's not about me. 
but I want to give a testimony to the truths that are found in the scriptures that our God is a God who is with us. I grieve the loss of my dad. I miss him. I miss him. It doesn't make sense. There's literally no answer. No answer for why this random thing happened where he lost his life. But I do not grieve as one without hope. My hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord because we serve a God who came not to be served, but a God who came to serve. We serve a God who is for us. And we serve a God who is with us, a God who moved heaven and earth, if you will, removing sin by dying on the cross for us so that things can be made right. So that things can be put back together, our relationship with God, with one another, with the world, and with ourselves. God is on the move. God is working. God is changing lives. He's on the move. And I know this to be true because Jesus himself said it in John 16, 32. Behold, the hour is coming. And indeed, it is coming when you will be scattered each to his own home and you will leave me alone. He's talking to his disciples, the guys who share deep life with him. And he's looking at them. He's saying, hey, fellas, it's about to get real bad. And you're about to run away scared and afraid. And in fact, you're going to leave me alone. But look what Jesus himself says. He says, yet I am not alone. For the Father, the Father is with me. The Father is with me. And I have said these things to you, even in the midst of his being left alone, knowing what's about to happen and going to the cross. Even in that moment, Jesus is still serving. And he's talking to this type of said, I've said these things to you. Guys who are about to run away, scared, and deny me, and be afraid of all the things, I'm saying them to you that in me, in Jesus Christ, the King of kings, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. You will face hardships. You will face discouragement. You will face trials. You will face tribulation. But take heart. Take heart. I have overcome the world. But take heart. Chapel Point, take heart, my friends, that no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances, death, loss, whatever it is, God is a God who is with us. He is a God who does not leave, a God who does not forsake. He says, take heart, take heart, take heart. Take heart, for I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. So as we hear this good news, I'm begging you to put your hope in Jesus and I'm begging you to run after him. I'm begging you to take heart, to trust Jesus, to follow after him, to stay faithful and to serve in your suffering. It is proof and evidence that our God is alive. He is alive. He is alive. He is alive. Until the day he comes back, we will take heart. So God, we trust you. God, we give you praise and thanks. You're a God who doesn't leave or forsake. You are the God who has overcome. So God, we don't even overcome. You have overcome on our behalf. So God, we simply rest and we receive your grace upon grace upon grace that is sufficient in all things. God, we do not come to you casually, but God, realizing that you paid the price for us, for our sins. And so God, forgive us where we have failed you. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, give us the courage to take heart, to step firmly into all that you've called us to, God. We take heart because you, Jesus Christ, are the king enthroned for your glory, for your purpose, your plans. Thank you, God. We don't deserve it, but yet it is for our good. Thank you for your love. I pray, Jesus Christ, this moment as we respond together to the gospel, the good news of what you've done for us. May you do a work in this room, online, in Byron Center, and in Holt, all across the world. Draw your children back, and may the earth resound in the exaltation that you are God. And there is no other. There is no other. For your name, Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Church, let's respond.
Come on. Come on.